Bibles, uh, Job chapter 1 tonight. Uh, bear with me, man, as I um, croak through this sermon tonight, amen, hallelujah. Can everybody hear me okay out of the microphone? Yeah, it sounds good, okay. Praise God. Job chapter 1, as we're going to believe God this evening, amen. <clears throat> uh, it was an article that I, I found. It says, science is finally... Uh, catching up to the Bible when it comes to the reality that religion does not make people more righteous. And they're citing a study, this organization called BeliefNet cites this study that was recently referenced in the Huffington Post. It said, sure to be controversial news research shows that religious and non-religious people are equally likely to misbehave. The only difference between the groups is that religious people show stronger emotional reactions to moral and immoral deeds. For the study, a team of researchers led by a psychologist named William Hoff, uh, 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 Hoffmanoff um, said they recruited 1,252 men and women between the ages of 18 and 68. The study participants, all of whom were from the U.S. or Canada, completed an initial survey to indicate their level of religiosity from not at all to or to very much. The survey also showed where the men and women fell on the political spectrum from very liberal to very conservative. The subjects then received surveys via text message several times a day over the course of several days asking them to report on their behavior, both good and bad, among other things. And so these guys are going around, you know, and they're saying, oh, man, today I drank a beer, you know, or, hey, today I did this. You know, I mean, they're reporting back to these people, you know. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Um, <clears throat> it says, um, what did the researchers find? Religious and non-religious people alike reported experiencing around the same number of moral acts. Furthermore, no difference was found between liberals and conservatives. People reported committing good deeds more often than bad ones and reported hearing about bad deeds more often than good ones. Ultimately, their conclusion was that religion did not play a significant role in the behavioral habits of the participants. <laughs> With that said, as you hear this story, think about it, the flaws in this kind of thinking, you know, for starters, religious versus non-religious persons will certainly define good and bad deeds and behavior quite differently to begin with. I mean, think about it. What you might consider bad as a Christian, some other person might say, well, I don't think there's a problem with that. You know, it, it's, 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 if you look at it correctly, I mean, think about it. While religious, while the religious might report the use of foul language or feeling, uh, you know, the feelings of lust, etc., as bad behavior, the non religious might think nothing of it. I mean, they don't think it's a problem. But for all the flaws, the bottom line conclusion is both true and biblical. Good behavior is not what makes a person righteous. How many understand that this evening? It's not good behavior that makes a person righteous. It is a relationship. Not behavior which defines moral justification or you know the moral justification relationship with the person of Jesus Christ as you know they they summarize here in this uh, study this is what they summarize science is just now catching up with the timeless truths revealed in the, revealed in the Bible which illustrate that human nature is inherently flawed it is only after we trade our nature with the infallible nature of God that we have the ability to experience true righteousness. Religion can exist on the surface. It can masquerade at church functions, pray lofty, pious prayers in public, but only relationship determines the sincere walk of a person truly following Jesus. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Listen, so I want you to consider this tonight. I mean, now, there's a lot to be said this evening about righteousness in regards to our Christian lives that is pertinent to the assaults of our lives and or the safeguarding of our lives. And I want you to consider this evening our text. And I want you, I want to read this. Job chapter 1. <coughs> um, Job chapter 1. We're going to read, um, uh, starting with, uh, let's start with uh, verse 6. Job chapter 1. <coughs> starting with verse 6 says these words. It says, um, Now there was a day. You don't want to start there? Yeah, okay says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. I mean, you just think about the whole scenario there. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come from, or from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth in it. If you continue uh, reading on there, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil? Uh, so Satan answered, and uh, so Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Uh, have you uh, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hand, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord. Listen, I want to stop right there very quick. Amen. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. In regards to this portion of Scripture, because it's, very, it's a very popular verse of scripture, portion of Scripture. And, you know, we, we tend to right away gravitate to the, the basic understanding of what it says on there. But consider this. The complaint... The complaint that Satan had, the complaint that Satan, the grievance that Satan had against God in regards to Job is what's denoted in verse 10, that God has made a hedge around him. Listen, the complaint that came from Satan in the midst of this whole scenario, the main grievance that he had against God in regards to Job was, listen, you have made a hedge around him. You have made a hedge around him, his household, and around all that he has on every side. He's actually saying, you've done this. And that's my complaint, that there was this impenetrable, God-produced hedge around this man Job, his family, his household, and uh, uh, around everything that he had and the problem that Satan had was listen man uh, you might say that this guy is a great guy but the problem is that you've put this hedge around him I can't penetrate that and would he have not your protection he wouldn't serve you the way he does that's, what, that's Satan's complaint I want you to think about this here this evening What's a hedge? By definition, a hedge is a fence or a boundary formed by close, closely growing bushes or shrubs. That's the basic definition of Webster's Dictionary. Listen, but we're talking about something, we're not talking about some carnal this evening or something natural of this world. The God produced hedge around Job and everything connecting to him was something spiritual and supernatural. If you do a study on this portion of scripture, the Hebrew word uh, that is used for the word hedge is the word suk. Which means to be entwined or shut in for protection. 
That's the Hebrew word used for the word hedge. That Job um, and all he had was spiritually and supernaturally entwined and shut in by God's provisional and providential protection. Listen to me. The complaint of Satan is that that hedge of protection was impenetrable spiritually and physically. Job and his family were the untouchables. That was Satan's complaint. Now this sounds awesome, you know, sounds cool, that that dynamic of God's involvement is powerful. And I'm sure many people would say, you know, I want that for my life. You know, I want that hedge of protection for all my stuff. But you know what people don't consider about this situation? What people do not consider in regards to this hedge is that Job was not predisposed to have it. Do you understand what I'm saying? We think about this hedge. We think about this protection that Job had. And we think, I want that. man. Job had this great protection from God. And we think, I want that. But what you don't understand is that Job wasn't predisposed to that. Job was not predisposed um, to having this hedge, amen. Uh, Job uh, was not entitled to it, but it was granted to him um, and all of his stuff because Job cultivated it. <coughs> That's what people don't understand. We, we see the outworking of God's blessing, um, of God's protection. <coughs> of God's provision, of God's working in a person's life, and we want that, and we desire that, but he wasn't entitled to it. He wasn't predisposed to it. Job cultivated that in his life. Listen to me. In other words, Job had this great thing going, this great hedge around him, but people do not consider what it took um, and what it cost to obtain that. But it is denoted in Scripture what it cost. Um, this is what made that hedge possible and effective. Job chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, says these words. This is what allowed for God to build this hedge of protection around Job, his family, about everything he had, was what is said in Job chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, <coughs> and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send an invite, uh, and invite their, uh, their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the day of feasting had run their course. These guys are, I don't know if you understand what it's saying there. Job's kids were a bunch of rebel backsliders. Job was a man of God. His kids are backslidden as backslidden could be. They're partying, drinking it up. I mean, just living life crazy, man. And listen to what it says. So when the day of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them. Job knew. Job knew his kids were backslidden. Job knew his kids were up to no good. Job knew they were out there partying. You know, he could hear it from down the street. And when it was all done, he knew they, these guys got down and dirty over there. My sons, as, as well as my daughters, they, they went crazy. They've been partying, you know, they went on a binge. The day's binging. The Bible says that Job would send and sanctify them. 
And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. No, no. It wasn't that it might be. You're a father. You know who your kids are. <laughs> you know what they were doing. Thus, Job did this regularly. Now listen. I don't know if you catch all this. God reiterates this in verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless, upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Think about it. Listen. The words, the words that sum up all these qualities and the lifestyle that Job possessed is righteousness. The main thought, the main word, the main idea behind everything that God did for Job, the, the hedge, the protection, the blessing, um, even in the midst of having backslidden kids um, and a half-hearted wife, the protection that came upon his family, upon his well-being, um, upon his wife, his marriage, was the fact that Job was a righteous man was the fact that Job took care of business as a leader. That even though his kids and his wife weren't living for God right, um, and yeah, they should have been cursed, um, and yeah, they should have been stricken down because Job um, was the man of God that he was called to be. They shared in that protection. What sums up the life of Job is righteousness. That we have a responsibility to righteousness. That we have a responsibility to cultivate a hedge of protection for ourselves, for our families, and everything that is connected to us. And the vehicle towards that hedge um, that allows God to solidify His protection, His providential and provisional protection, His hedge of protection, the vehicle is righteousness. Think about it. What is the dynamic of righteousness this evening? The dynamic of righteousness is denoted in our text. One, blameless. One is blameless. Two, uprightness. It's all written in scripture. Three, fearing God and shunning evil. That could be three or four. Five, prayer. Right? Six, intercessory prayer. Because if you look at Job's life, Job wasn't just praying. He was praying, but then he would intercede for his kids. Sanctification. Seven, eight, whatever. And then there's the sacrifice part. It talks about the sacrifice. Dynamic of righteousness. Listen. The dynamic of righteousness. In a person's life, you know, whether you're a husband or a wife or a dad, mom, whatever, it's, 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 it's all encased in these things. Righteousness. But inside righteousness is blameless, uprightness, fearing God, shunning evil, prayer, intercessory, prayer, sanctification, sacrifice. That is that this lifestyle cultivated and produce um, uh, this as we uh, as we cultivate this it produces a god approved them a god ordained a god empowered dynamic of protection that not only benefited job um, but benefited his half-hearted wife and his backslidden kids listen to me without this hedge of protection Without us, us cultivating this hedge of protection, our marriages will suffer. Our families will fall apart. Our health will suffer. Our financial stability will suffer. If we don't cultivate that, it's, it's written in scripture. All those things will suffer.
if we don't cultivate this hedge of protection, all these things, our financial stability, nowhere, no, nowhere, anytime do we think that my lack of righteousness um, or my lack of cultivating a hedge through righteousness for my family will affect my financial stability. We never think that. But yet you look at Job's life, and we're going to read that right now. That's exactly what's affected. <laughs> we as leaders, as fathers, as believers, Christians, have a responsibility to cultivate this God-empowered hedge. Listen, that, you know, where there is no hedge this evening, the devil thrives. Where there is no hedge, the devil thrives there. The devil runs rampant. It's in the desire of Satan is proven in our text that this hedge, if you, if you understand what we're saying, what I'm saying here this morning, this hedge either never, you know, what he desires is that this hedge never get cultivated, or that somehow, some way he can have this hedge removed. Listen to Job chapter 1, verse 9 through 12. It's our text. We read this. So Satan, so Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, listen, the desire of Satan is what says in verse 11. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Listen to verse 12 because God said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. Listen, you know what God did there? As Satan brings this accusation before God, um, saying, listen, um, uh, I understand um, that Job is this righteous man um, and that you've put this hedge around him. However, um, his righteousness um, uh, you know, will change if you remove that hedge. Um, that just because you are protecting him is what's keeping Job um, in that right relationship with you. That it, would that be removed? Job would not continue in righteousness. And God agrees. Listen, think about that here this evening because God says, okay, tell you what, Satan, let's remove the hedge. But God, I got it, Satan, I got it. You think that this guy is righteous and holy because what I've done for him. I say he's righteous and holy because of who I am. Let's find out, Satan, remove the hedge. We're going to remove the hedge. He's all yours. Just don't kill him. Do whatever you want. Just don't kill him. And listen, the Bible says, so Satan went from the presence of the Lord. Satan goes, yes, <laughs> takes off. That's all he wanted. All Satan wants is for that hedge to be removed. All Satan needs is for that hedge to be removed. Listen to me. Everything he wanted and what happens next in Job's life is what we all know about the life and the story of Job. And that his, uh, his hedge, when it got removed, man, you know, Job lost everything. You can read it for yourself, amen. You know, I, I didn't want to read it for the sake of time, but, you know, Job lost everything, all his provision. When, the, when God removed that hedge... Job lost his provision, his resources, that all were under God's protection, lost at the hands of evil men through natural disasters. When his backsliding kids were partying and drinking through a natural disaster, they were killed. His half-hearted, lukewarm wife, through the prolonged process of this ordeal, commits apostasy. Job's friends turn his back on him. Job loses his health, but not his faith. And he alone survives this ordeal. The question is why and how? Think about it. Think about it. When the hedge got removed, 
I don't know if you understand this here this evening. When that hedge got removed, the devil had access to his kids. When God removed the hedge that Job cultivated through his righteousness, the devil was able to get at his, at his kids. The devil didn't kill his kids, but through a natural disaster was able to bring death to them. Doesn't that why we pray? To protect, right? Listen, the question is why and how was it that Job was the only one to survive this whole ordeal? Listen, the entire ordeal, everything was lost. His family, his wealth, his health, his marriage, his kids, his friends, everything was lost. The only thing that survived was Job's soul. That was it. Because even his health had diminished. His breath is the only thing that survived. His soul, that's it. But everything else died. Why and how? Have you ever considered that? Listen, without the hedge of protection that comes from righteousness, without that hedge of protection that comes from righteousness, from leadership, headship, in the home, vulnerability makes those who benefit from that protection simple prey to the wiles and the strategy of hell. Only Job survived the ordeal because only Job possessed the goods for survival. The reason why Job was the only one to survive because Job was the only one that was praying. Job was the only one that was sacrificing. Job was the only one that was sanctifying. Job was the only one that was fasting. Job was the only one that was memorizing and reciting scripture and promises. You hear it. You can read it for yourself where he begins to quote scripture. His wife says, Have, you know, do you still hold on to your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? Think about that. Think about that. In the midst, listen, she's never acted like that before. You can read, it, read the whole life of Job. She never acted like that. But in the moment of crisis, that woman broke. She was fine. She loved God. She served God. She was there while he was making sacrifices. But in a moment of crisis, because she did not possess the goods to survive, that woman cracked. She cracked. It speaks to the importance of us leaders, men, husbands, wives, whatever. The importance of us cultivating this hedge of protection. We don't know how the hedge that we cultivate through righteousness really affects our life until it's taken away until it's removed that we all have a responsibility to be righteous and cultivate this impenetrable hedge of protection no matter who we are but think about the blessing the hope the long suffering that comes from a righteous leader who cultivates this hedge not just for himself but for his marriage, for his family, for his health, for his financial stability, and everything and everyone that is connected to him. See, when we say, listen to me, folks, when I say pray, you hear me talk about prayer all the time. When I say pray, I'm talking about this. Because prayer, pray, pray, listen, if you don't pray for your wife, listen to me, 
If you don't pray, first of all, God help you. But if you don't pray for your wife, if you don't pray for your husband, God help them. There is this great need for us interceding for our husbands, our wives, our children. It cultivates a hedge of protection. You look at your life, I mean, you see the assaults around. Listen, let me tell you something. If your husband is not up to par and contending and cultivating this hedge, then it's your responsibility, wife, to build that. That, you know, I hear it all the time. Well, he's the husband. Well, he's the man. I understand that. But are you really going to, you know, risk everything else that is at stake because your husband's a deadbeat? Because he doesn't do what he's supposed to. Are you going to really let risk everything because he just won't do what he needs to do? It's your responsibility. If you see your husband, he's not up to par, you need to pray for him. And you need to step into that place and begin to contend and believe God and cultivate that hedge. Because if you don't, wife, if you don't, you're just as bad as a problem. You're just as big of a problem as he is. Job's kids were fine doing whatever they wanted to do because of Job's righteousness. Were protected because of Job's righteousness. You want to protect your kids? You don't protect your kids by being strict on them. You protect your kids by praying for them and cultivating a hedge for them. I understand strictness is relevant. But if you're basing your kids' security and your kids' well-being by being strict, you're a fool. You are a fool. Because the way you cultivate that protection and the way you cultivate helping them is you need to pray for them. You need to get on your knees and you need to lay a hold of God for those kids. You need to pray. You need to fast for them. You need to lift them up in prayer. You know why? Because you know your kids. You see them. You know their tendencies. You'd, you're a fool if you think your kids are perfect. You're a fool if you think, no, not my kids. My kids are great. You're a fool. You know your kids. Pray for them. Lift them up. Say, God, help these kids, man. Because I know we're in church, but these kids are crazy. These kids have issues, man. God, you need to help me. You need to help them. God, I'll lift them up before God. Help me reach them. Help me speak into them. I see it so much. Parents are, oh, no, not my kids. No, 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 not me, hito. Not me, no, not my mijo. Everybody's kids are bad except your mijo. Or mija. Listen. You have to cultivate a hedge. You have to pray for them. Your financial stability is dependent on the hedge that you cultivate. Your financial stability, listen, you don't think about that. Study Job's financial stability as he went through this ordeal. He lost his entire financial stability was lost. You wonder why you struggle financially? Cultivate a hedge. You're struggling financially. Listen, guys, I'm telling you, I am telling you, your financial stability is dependent on you building that hedge of protection. Family, marriage, health. Your health. If your husband's not praying for you this evening, then you pray for yourself, for your health. We want to know what the imploration here this evening is. If there's something that you will grab a hold of from this sermon is this. It's men. Men. You have a responsibility to cultivate a hedge for the protection of your family. But, 
if that is not happening, if you could be honest with yourself, look at your marriage. If you can be honest, look at your husband and be like, this guy just don't got it, man. <laughs> this guy ain't doing it. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, praise God for this guy, but hey, man, he, this guy don't got the goods, man. <laughs> then wife, it is your responsibility to step into that role and begin to cultivate that for your family. Because what she had not, what had Job's wife cultivated that for herself, she would have not fallen the way she did. She would have not. She would have not cracked the way she did. And think about it. What, is, wh what a sad thing. You know, I thank God for my wife. Because through all the ordeals, everything I've ever been through, the hardest, darkest moments, my wife's always been there for me. Some of the lowest points in my life, things that determine my future in ministry. It was my wife that spoke words of encouragement into my life. It was my wife. What a horrible, tragic thing to be a man of God. Go through some very dark times and not even have a wife to back you up. To go through some of the most horrible things, most darkest things in your life. And you can't even rely on your wife to be there to back you up. We have a responsibility this evening to understand the dynamic of hedging, the cultivation of a hedge of protection. Listen, if you want if, if you can't remember this stuff, read Job. It tells it lists everything in there. It lists it all for you. You can go one by one and make sure you practice that into your life. If we don't, if we don't, our families, our entire well-being, our health, our financial stability, easy pray for the devil. Easy pray. God had to remove Job's hedge to let the devil get at him. What about those that have no hedge? I mean, God had to actually make an, an executive decision and say, okay, I'm removing the hedge. Have at him. But that's because Job cultivated that. That was, he did that like clockwork. I mean, that was his life. Prayer, intercessory prayer, sacrifice, uh, you know, sanctifying. I mean, that's all he did. What about those that don't have that? What about those that don't do that? I mean, I mean think about it, guys. If, if you don't pray, that's fine. At least pray for your wife and kids. At least pray for your wife and kids. And, and I'll tell you this much. If you pray for your wife and kids, it'll take you more than two minutes. I promise you that. It will take you more than three minutes. It will take you more than five minutes to pray for your wife and kids. It will, it will take you some time. If anything, pray for that. Make, begin to cultivate this evening. Begin to cultivate this hedge of protection around your family. Around your marriage, around your kids, around your, you know, your, your finances, around every part of your life, your health. You can cultivate that. And you can change the dynamic of your life through your prayers, through your life in righteousness. I want everybody's head bowed and eyes closed this evening.